Yes, good morning. Welcome to this lecture. I believe number 10 in this series of 12 plus 1 lectures on introductory statistics. T today we're going to do some gaming. Or we're not really going to do it. I just show you this because this is one of the, you could call it one of the ball games where the topic that I will be discussing today plays an important role. The topic I will be discussing is simulation, or computer simulation, or Monte Carlo simulation, or whatever you want to, to call it. So, and what is, uh, this is the major Danish supplier of, of, of games. Are we okay? Um, you can do a lot of games on the computer here, and I can't even, I, I don't do it myself. And that's also because I know I'm at, a, I'm, I'm at risk to become addicted. So when you're at risk, don't do it. So I don't do it personally. I have been in Vegas and all and tried this stuff and it can, it can push you, so I don't do it. Anyway, some people do it. Um, you can do all sorts of games and the computer can play with you, right? You can do uh, this type of games and you can do a lot of games, you can do other types of games, and the computer generates the numbers. And most often we believe that the computer does that in a random way. Um, at least we hope that Denske Spill is a fair supplier of games to us and that someone is checking them every now and then. Actually, there's a funny thing here because uh, Denske Spill is also using software and programs and they have to design everything and they can do mistakes. I mean, you have to do things on the computer, we'll discuss that today. But they are actually working with people from our group in statistics on monitoring games and the way games go using the same principles that you would monitor industrial processes where you produce cars or computer equipment or whatever. You want to monitor such processes to see whether things are in order and don't go somewhere it shouldn't go. And they had Denske Spill done that previously, they would have more uh, earlier on found some of the mistakes they've done. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the mistakes they might have done. One mistake, though, I could tell you was that uh, they had this uh, do it for fun game where you should, uh, where they show. Now, if you do this uh, scrabble spell where you scratch things and if you have three in a row, you win half a million or something like that. And then they had this uh, uh, just showing you, and then, of course, it would show you here's what you could do, and here is half a million. Whoa, yes, you were winning. And then by, by mistake, they had the actual game hooked up with this showing it for fun, such that people won, was winning half a million. And then they did it again, and they won half a million, and they did it again. And, and uh, people actually repeatedly, before they realized that something was, was wrong. That was a pretty obvious mistake that rapidly would have been taken by a statistical monitoring process, because two, three in a row would be too unlikely, and you would shut it down. This is just a short story. They've done other more subtle mistakes in their programming, which didn't have any consequence for the amount of money paying out, but did have some more subtle consequences, actually. Anyway, simulation is actually the name of the game today. Let me, I was at the end here, let's go to the beginning. And simulation is to us in our statistics course important, I will show you, because we can use the idea of simulation. Simulation, sort of the term simulation or random simulation sort of is a term for many different things. We are going to use it for doing statistics. That's the point. Um, before we do that, I'll spend most of basically the first lecture on introducing the idea of simulation more generally. And then the second lecture is on how we use the idea for doing statistics, which is our course here. And this is uh, the plan. 
The first part is here, and the second part is here, the, and one key word in the second part is something that we call bootstrapping, which is a nice way of doing statistics based on the simulation idea. So that's the structure of today's lecture. So let's go to the real introduction to the simulation issue. Although, just a sidestep still, I'm going to motivate why we are going to take in a bit more, why we will take up the idea of simulation at all in this course. Why don't I leave it to other courses? It's a good method, but why here? Well, the point is, at least one point is, that if we look at this table 8.1 that I showed you a few weeks ago, let's see if I go up a little up here, this is the table that summarizes everything we learned in chapter 7 and 8 on comparing means, one and two means, paired, unpaired, uh, blah, 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 confidence intervals, hypothesis testing. I already made the point at that time, now let me repeat that point, is that in this table, either we assume that we have a large sample, or we assume that the system behaves like a normal distribution, the system we are observing behaves like a normal. One of those two things must be in place to use the methods of this table, to use the standard, which by now should be standard methods for you on how to compute confidence intervals and hypothesis testing for means and two means. What should we do if we have small samples, and that is, of course, this is not black and white, but the rule of thumb in this course is small samples is defined by less than 30. And we don't like to assume or maybe even know for sure that these things cannot be described by a normal distribution. Then we have no tools so far in the course. The tools of chapter 7 and 8 and 9, by the way, is lost. We cannot use them. They are not valid. We cannot trust them. Then, as I said, in the old days, we did something differently. There is a chapter 14 in the book, if you would run through the book, which is based on what is known as non-parametric testing. This is kind of a sort of more rough way, looking at the numbers instead of looking. It's, it's a bit like going the median way, you could say, not actually using the numbers as they are, but just using, the, for example, the order of the numbers or the rank of the numbers, and just trying to know about the system by looking at this information, not assuming a normal distribution or anything on the observations, but being a bit more rough in the way we look at it. That is all okay, and nothing wrong with that. It's just a bit limited in the scopes of where you can use that. So uh, I, I dare to say it's a slightly old-fashioned maybe to go that way. The good thing about these, these methods were, in the old days were, that simple formulas came out that could be handled rather easily by hand calculation. That was important 50 years ago, maybe even 40 years ago. When I was a child, this was important. Now it's not important anymore. This is a change. I mean, the history of stats is more than, is much older than the history of the com 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 computer. But the development of the computer, obviously, as it has changed many things, it has also changed the, <laughs> the, the way we can work with stats in, uh, in a daily practice. So now it's more common, I would say, as the alternative to the classical methods to do what you could call simulation-based methods, where we use raw computing force rather than theory to find out about uh, what we want to find out about. Right? So we, we substitute some of the mathematical theory by raw computing. That's, uh, that's, the, point of, that's the whole uh, point of it. It's much easier, actually, up to obtain confidence intervals than the classical methods. It is more easy to apply, as I said, in more complicated situations. Now I'm going to show you how to do it in the most simple situations that, that we met in Chapter 7 and 8. One and two uh, sets of means. But the simulation-based idea I'm going to present to you today, you can use that in all situations. No, there's no limit to the complexity where you can use it. And this, this is the really, really strong uh, part or strong 
feature of this approach is that it can actually make an advanced mathematician out of all of us. If we are just as slightly, just being a very naive programmer, a very naive computer user, we can turn ourselves into a very advanced mathematician by being able to have the computer do it for us. That's the whole idea. And since I, that's very appealing to me, sort of being a naive programmer, you can become an advanced mathematician. Uh, this is also, I mean, my mathematics friends are going to hear this at, at some point in time, and then I'll get into trouble. But until then, I'll be okay. Um, and we have the R tool, and that is just a dream for the people who want to do things like this. Now, what is simulation really, or computer simulation, maybe I should say, which I, this is, as I understand it. Really, we are going to have the computer generate random numbers for us. And maybe we should emphasize then that, of course, this is kind of pseudo-random numbers because a computer, at least the level of computers that I know of, cannot truly generate random things for us in action. But we can generate things such that we cannot distinguish them f from being random. That's the whole idea. There are such a thing as a random number generator. That's kind of a sort of in between mathematical theory and computer science theory, you could say, uh, that uh, people have designed, and uh, this is quite old uh, theory actually by now, uh, that if you have some kind of algorithm, and an algorithm here is defined by if you plug, if you throw in, if you throw in a number, then another number comes out of it. If you throw in this, another number comes out of it. So it generates it's like a series of numbers. And, and there is a mathematical formula for how to do that. It looks pretty nasty when you look at it. And, uh, so I'm not even, and I'm not an expert in those different uh, generators. I just know that they are there, and I, I use them. If you have something, and this is what is built into the computer today, some functions, some algorithms that can do this for us, producing a series, a list of numbers, such that when you look at these numbers, they look exactly, for instance, and that is the start of everything, as if they come from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. So you can have such algorithms generate numbers between 0 and 1, such that if you look at them, they are completely equally distributed across the interval 0 to 1. You cannot see that they were not random. So they are random in the sense that you cannot distinguish them from being random when they are there. And you can make the computer do things like that. It's pretty fantastic, actually, you can, but it's, and it's pretty neat. Such a thing, when you put in a number, a random number generator, it needs a start. Um, in, in this uh, area, it, such a start is usually called a seed. And uh, the, the, the functions in R usually use the setting of the com computer clock somehow to put in a seed to, to the, these random numbers. And in the daily work with this, we don't even have to think about it. You can control it if you want. You can control the seed if you want to do some computations that you want to reproduce exactly. Otherwise, when you do a new random thing, I mean, a new data comes out. But you might want to be able to document exactly what you do, and then you can control the seed. But for the, the use in this course, we don't need to think about that. Uh, so, so don't worry about this seed thing. Can be controlled, but we don't have to here. Now, the basic result, which is a neat one, I wouldn't necessarily, I didn't have to show you this result, but it's such a neat result that I thought I would not take it away from you uh, and, and uh, share that with you. Usually such algorithms produces, as I said, random numbers on the zero, one, interval. Let's do the 0, 1 interval here. Then if I produce sort of random numbers, go away, random numbers on the 0, 1 interval, then I can get random numbers from any distribution by using the distribution function. Here's a distribution function of some distribution. The distribution function is one that starts at 0 and goes up to 1. Right, the, the accumulated densities. Um, 
Then, if I have something which is uniform, and then I apply the inverse distribution function, this is, for instance, the Q norm. The Q norm, that's the inverse P norm. The P norm could be the F, and the Q norm is the inverse F. If I apply this one, that is that I go backwards here in this one, like this, like this, and I, I use the inverse function here to produce numbers. This would be U, and down here I could have Y, we could call it. If I use that to produce some random Ys, I have something which follow the distribution given by F. This is pretty neat. I mean, we would need to make a mathematical proof to make it, I'm not gonna do it, don't worry. To make such a mathematical proof, we would need to deal with a nonlinear transformation of a random variable. This I don't teach you in this course. I do touch on it in the additional math videos, and you would have to do the probability course, 2405, 02405, 02405, to actually learn these uh, steps, if you want to learn that. It can be done, it's not rocket science, but uh, you need an additional course to actually learn it. Anyway, we don't have to do it, actually. This, <laughs> so I, I, I told you I, wouldn't, I didn't have to share this result, theoretical result with you, because everything is ready for us. I mean, every distribution we can think of has been prepared for us in our, uh, in our software R, such that we can generate random binomials, random Poissons, random hybrids, random normals, and whatever by this principle. So we can, act, we can already do it, and we will start soon to play around with what we can use this for. No, let's not soon, let's do it now. Let's just show you for the first time. Let's, uh, for instance, the first thing I do here is to to take 1,000 random uniforms and make a histogram. This is how 1,000 random uniforms looks, right? And from time to time, there's a little deviation on it, but basically, this is the picture of random uniforms, right? What if I look at what I do down here? Here I have random uniforms, 1,000 of them. And then I apply the Q, Q norm function on these random uniforms. And here we have the normal. Now only 1,000, still 1,000. So that's the normal, actually. And this random, this, the same thing could be achieved, of course, directly by taking random normals, for instance, with a mean of two and a standard deviation of three, and looking at the histogram of these, and that's the same thing. So it's not more difficult than that. We can do simulation of any kind of distribution like this. I hope you already by now you get a feeling of that this is a strong tool, that we can play around with these complicated, maybe you're, you're already frustrated about all the theory I showed you in the beginning of the course with the means and the variances and probabilities, well, if you can do a little bit of this, you don't have to worry about all the formulas, all the theory I showed you. You can handle it here. If I don't know what the, uh, we will get to it. Let's uh, move on to the next part, which is the first example.